go ahead and get started with our discussion for today. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Amanda Sauls. I'm this year's president of the Texas Federalist Society. The Federal Society is a national network comprised of conservative and libertarian students, attorneys, judges, and scholars. And as a student chapter, the Texas Federal Society strives to promote freedom, federalism, and the rule of law, and we do so through facilitating debate and discussion within the law school community. Today we have a great discussion on federal criminal law and possible reforms, and um, National Trust as our VP of Speakers is going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Since our event's a little shorter, I'm going to do a really short introduction. Um, we have with us today Clark Neely. Uh, Clark Neely is the Vice President for Criminal Justice at the Cato Institute. Uh, he leads Cato's efforts on criminal justice issues and related topics. And before joining Cato, he was uh, he spent 17 years at the Institute for Justice uh, as a senior attorney. Um, we also have Professor Klein. Um, many of you might have her for criminal law. Um, <laughs> Professor Klein is a nationally prominent scholar in the fields of criminal procedure, federal criminal law, sentencing, and prosecutorial ethics. And uh, she's written a lot of articles that have appeared in top 10 law journals and have been cited by the Supreme Court. So, and she was a federal criminal prosecutor for four, four years. Um, so please uh, help me in welcoming our speakers. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me down. It's um, great to be back at my alma mater. I was undergrad law school here, so it's always a treat. And um, playing back to the full run is exciting. I want to start off with a couple of, um, I don't know concessions, but stipulations and then one illustration. So first thing I want to do is I want to um, go on record as saying I am absolutely of the view that, uh, that to have a well-functioning society, you must have a well-functioning criminal justice system. I think it's absolutely indispensable. Uh, second is that I think that in comparison to most other criminal justice systems in the world that I'm aware of, I think America's is better. If I knew that I was going to be arrested and prosecuted, I'd probably rather have that happen here in America than most other countries. Uh, and I'd go so far as to say that from what I know of it, it is certainly my impression that the federal criminal justice system is in general better than most state criminal justice systems. Uh, that being said, I think there are huge problems with it. I think there are very serious concerns. And I think that it may fail the one quality that all criminal justice systems should have, which is that they are both substantively and by perception fair enough that they're entitled to our support. In other words, that when a U.S. attorney goes into a courtroom, a federal district court, and says, I am here on behalf of the United States, which is what they say, that we feel comfortable that that person is speaking in our name and that what happens in that courtroom is done in our name. And I'm here to tell you that I'm extremely uncomfortable with that fact, and I do not want prosecutors saying that they're there in my name, because I don't think our procedures uh, are up to the level where they should be or what the Constitution requires. Let me do the illustration. Um, anybody familiar with Smokey the Bear? All right, would somebody make me a sketch? I don't care how bad it is, just make me a sketch, and I'll pay you a dollar for the sketch of Smokey the Bear. Who's got, who's got my back on Smokey the Bear? Who can do it first? Let's go. It's a competitive environment. Please, somebody, give me a sketch of Smokey the Bear. Let me know when you've, when you've completed it. I'll come and give you the dollar, and then I'll complete the illustration. Um, you look like you're trying to find some paper. Would it be helpful if I brought you a pen and paper? Yeah. Tell me your name? Paul. Paul. Do you think you can knock this out in five seconds so we can just continue kind of the Absolutely. Okay. Paul is going to produce a one dollar a sketch of Smokey the Bear. This is the bear that the, the Forest Service invented to tell us how fires around and burn down forests. Yes. Okay. Actually, that's pretty good. <laughs> Paul, thank you very much. Paul and I have just conspired to violate federal law. <laughs> no kidding. You guys didn't know that? That's 18 U.S.C. Section 711 makes it a crime for anybody to pr uh, produce a likeness of Smokey the Bear for profit, which you just did. <laughs> um, how many people have committed a federal crime in the last month? For those of you not raising your hands, I ask you this. How on earth would you know? How on earth would you know the answer to that question? Did you know that the Department of Justice tried to count all of the federal crimes and gave up? There's more than 4,000, but they're spread throughout the U.S. Code. No one can count them. Other people have tried to count them, too. It can't be done. Um, if you're out for a hike this weekend out in West Texas, where I was with my family about six months ago on a, on a road trip, do you happen to know which bird feathers you shouldn't pick up if you don't want to commit a federal crime? You know? Pretty good idea? No, me either. 
I know I'm not going to pick up a golden eagle feather because that is definitely a federal crime. I'm not sure which other birds are covered by the Migratory Species Act. I don't want to find out. Um, so here's the first problem with criminal, federal criminal law. It's all criminal law. There are so many crimes on the books, and so many of them have nothing to do with right and wrong, uh, that ordinary people commit crimes, both state and federal, all the time. You might even know some people who prefer um, a, an intoxicant that's not legal. Uh, and they might commit crimes deliberately. Um, let me ask you what you think of this. What would you say if tomorrow uh, the state of Texas said that it is still permissible to drink hard alcohol, but it is a felony to consume beer or wine? Would that seem a bit odd? Well, for one thing, they'd be getting the science exactly backwards. The science is abundantly clear that hard alcohol is more destructive than beer or wine. You know what I've just done? I've just described federal drug policy as it relates to alcohol and marijuana. Alcohol is an extremely destructive drug, both to people's health and socially, and marijuana is not. In fact, there's never been a single documented death from marijuana overdose, ever. And alcohol kills about 40,000 people a year. So we've got it exactly backwards. And that uh, leads me to the first point that I want to make about criminal law in general, and definitely federal criminal law, and that is that we have really no idea what limits there are on the government's ability to criminalize various kinds of conduct. What if, uh, what if tomorrow the federal government made it illegal to possess or distribute Harry Potter books? Would that be constitutional or unconstitutional? Well, most certainly unconstitutional. Why? Somebody tell me why. Is it because the government can't ban books? Is that it? False. They can ban books. My best friend uh, is the head of the litigation department at the CIA, no kidding. Um, and he actually is one of the only people in D.C. that I know who actually does know where the bodies are buried. Um, and it would be impermissible for him to write a book about his experiences and just go publish it. There is a pre-publication -pre process that he is required to go through, and they could absolutely ban the publication of a book that he wrote um, if it didn't go through the pre-publication process. What we have instead is a well-developed framework for assessing the constitutionality of various laws that restrict the publication of books, and we know what questions to ask, and we know what constitutional standards should apply, and so on and so on. Um, but when it's just anything other than that, let's say, let's say there was a plant that made you feel hungry and giggly. Um, do we have any idea what questions the government uh, should have to answer in terms of whether they can put you in a cage for, for consuming that plant? By the way, they will put you in a cage for possessing the wrong kind of plant. It's absolutely uh, something that, not, not as much as a lot of people think, um, drug crimes are not uh, the, the vast majority of federal prosecutions, which is fine. Um, they are almost half, almost half the people in state prisons are there with drug crimes of one kind or another. I'm not going to turn this into a whole drug lecture. Um, that's a separate talk. Um, and one that I don't really have a dog, much dog to fight. I'm kind of old school. I, I just like cocktails um, and wine and beer, but I don't, I, don't, I don't do the other stuff. But I think other people should be able to, unless there's something actually at stake there. And I just think personally there's absolutely nothing at stake for society with many of the criminal laws that we enforce, but one of the things that we do when the courts allow the government to just criminalize stuff willy-nilly, and I think that's a very fair statement, that is pretty much how we decide what's a crime, it's willy-nilly. Um, and any of you who've ever worked in a legislature, you probably could back me up on that. Um, the deliberation that we are told goes into these um, uh, decisions about whether to criminalize stuff is a total myth, um, by and large. So we tend to criminalize conduct willy-nilly, uh, courts don't require an explanation for crazy stuff like allowing a fairly destructive drug to be widely consumed but making it illegal to consume a perfectly harmless drug, et cetera, et cetera. One of the real concerns you have then is what? You're going to have a very significant number of people in society at any given time who are perfectly good, decent people who have chosen to break the law. I'm talking somewhat about drug laws here, but not entirely. Other people gamble. Uh, that's, that's to me a harmless law. There was a dentist in Fairfax County, not far from where I live outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, he would go to the local sports bar, he bet a little bit on basketball, he met a guy there who was also into betting on basketball and then slowly bet more and more and they were getting up to something like $500 a game. Turns out that guy was an undercover detective from the Fairfax County Police Department who had kind of led this, this, young, this 30 year old dentist into betting more and more. And so when they finally decided to drop the, the hammer on him, they sent a SWAT team, they sent a tactical team out to arrest him even though he was a nonviolent guy and they shot and killed him. Supposedly because one of the SWAT guys tripped and his weapon went off and he killed him. I, I don't know what happened, I wasn't there, but it was awfully stupid to send a tactical team for a dentist um, for gambling. 
So there's all kinds of totally harmless laws that I think if there were any kind of judicial review in this area would likely be struck down. But there, are, there isn't any real judicial review. So what we've done is we've made criminals of, of significant numbers of people in this country who are perfectly good, decent people, the kind of people you and I would want to hang out with, but they're criminals. And one thing that does right off the bat is it makes it a matter of life and death for some of these people to have an involuntary encounter with law enforcement. Does anybody remember the name Philando Castile? He was an African-American gentleman outside of Minneapolis who was shot and killed by a police officer. He was unarmed. He'd been pulled over for a busted taillight. He advised the police officer that he had a concealed carry permit and a weapon. The cop lost it and shot him seven times through the window of his own car. The police officer's testimony at trial was that he smelled marijuana in the car and assumed that he was confronting a hardened criminal. Why? Because that's who smokes marijuana. False. Lots of people smell marijuana, not just hardened criminals. But in that encounter, in that encounter, <clears throat> it was a matter of life and death for both sides. It's a matter of life and death for the police officer because he was afraid he might actually be confronting a criminal. It's a matter of life and death for Philando Castile because he was driving a car. Let's just say he was smoking marijuana. In that moment, when that police officer pulls him over, that police officer holds his state in his hands. He can take away that car. He can take away the four-year-old girl who was riding in the back seat. He can take away that guy's job. He can take away his liberty by deciding he wants to be a hard case and enforce that law. Sometimes they exercise their discretion and just give you a warning and you go on your way, but you don't know. You don't know what they're going to do. Uh, so problem one in our criminal justice system, and emphatically in our federal criminal justice system, is allowing the government to make criminals of perfectly good, decent people by saying that conduct, like smoking or selling marijuana, where society really has little or nothing at stake, is illegal. Lots of people are going to keep doing it. They'll still be good, decent people. They'll just happen to be criminals. Uh, and so they then have an extremely strong interest in never having involuntary contact with law enforcement. And then that leads to all kinds of policing issues, um, because the police are never sure when they encounter a stranger. Nighttime traffic stop, those are supposed to be terrifying, or just coming up to somebody on the street. Is this somebody who's violating the law right now? Because lots of people do. Uh, lots of good people do, seemingly good people. Um, and of course, when a police officer confronts somebody who is actively violating the law, some number of those people are going to run, some number of those people are going to fight. And so we've got, um, we've created a situation where there's a much more adversarial relationship between police officers out there enforcing many laws for which society has nothing at stake, but they have to be done aggressively, very aggressively sometimes. Um, go look at the uh, rise in the use of SWAT teams if, you're, if you doubt that. Um, and, and again, literally, there's just nothing at stake for society, but we're, we're putting people in cages routinely for, for conduct that, that doesn't threaten anybody's safety and doesn't bother anybody. Uh, moving down the line, one of the biggest concerns I have in our criminal justice system, and again, this is emphatically part of the federal criminal justice system, is we have essentially eliminated the criminal jury trial. About 97% of criminal convictions in the federal system are obtained through plea bargain, uh, and it's about 95 or 96% in the state system. I have no idea how many of those people are actually guilty of the crimes that they're, they're accused of. I hope it's most, I hope it's all, but we know from anecdotal evidence that it's not all. But we have a procedure that is, I think, hugely problematic. Here's the procedure, basically. We outlaw a whole bunch of stuff. We um, have a criminal justice system that is so complex that a layperson can't hope to navigate it themselves. You don't really have any chance of, real chance of representing yourself in court, so you need a lawyer. We then make legal representation so expensive that most people can't afford it. Uh, so about 80% of the people who go through our criminal justice system have a court-appointed public defender. And then we try to make sure those public defenders are so overworked uh, that they don't have more than a few hours to spend on any given case. That is one exception in the federal system. Federal public defenders, by and large, are extremely good uh, and generally have less of a, uh, an overwork issue than state public defenders. But it is still the case that you are likely to have uh, be represented by a lawyer who's been appointed and, and, and where there's a huge resource amount. <coughs> by and large, prosecutors get paid more than public defenders. <coughs> prosecutors have access to uh, free investigators in the form of FBI agents and other federal law enforcement uh, officers. They have a tremendous number of advantages as compared to the defendant's side of the case uh, and the ability to decide what charges to bring. Has anybody ever heard of a practice called overcharging? So overcharging is what? What, sir? Like when you just charge somebody with everything you can think of knowing that you can't get it to stick, but knowing that you can also use that as leverage to make a plea bargain to something you otherwise wouldn't have evidence for. So you charge them with crimes that are maybe on the board. I mean, I, hopefully you, not that you know you can't make stick, but they're you know, maybe more serious than really the, the, the case warrants in an effort to leverage a plea bargain. This is actually specifically unethical in Great Britain, according to their professional code of conduct. It is unethical to do this, but not here in America. It's not considered to be a violation of professional ethics. 
Uh, I, who knows how often it happens? That's obviously a very subjective call, but it happens a fair amount. Um, I'll give you one rather spectacular example. Have you ever heard of Aaron Schwartz? Aaron Schwartz was an internet, internet genius. He helped invent Reddit when he was 19 years old. Um, a few years later, he was a graduate assistant at Harvard University. Uh, he had access to an academic database called JSTOR. He was only supposed to be on three articles a day. He felt like this was kind of keeping a bunch of important knowledge behind closed doors, and he invented a computer program to essentially download all of these articles from JSTOR. Went over to MIT, went into a computer closet, hooked up the laptop with the program on it, and started downloading documents from JSTOR. He was arrested and he was prosecuted by the Massachusetts uh, state authorities, and then the federal government got involved. The U.S. Attorney's Office for Boston got involved. Based on what I've described so far, so he violated the terms of service with JSTOR and he broke into a computer closet at MIT where he shouldn't have been. What's an appropriate punishment for that conduct? Anybody? Throw something out. Trespassing. Trespassing. How many years in jail for that? One to five. No, like a few months. Don't be insane. <laughs> So I led you in the wrong direction. So when I asked this question, I probably asked maybe a thousand people this question. The usual response I get is something like maybe a $500 fine, community service, maybe a few months in jail. By the time the Boston U.S. Attorney's Office got done charging Aaron Schwartz, he was facing an 11-count felony indictment for federal computer crimes for which the penalty was 35 years in jail and a million-dollar fine. And we'll never know how that case came out because he hung himself while he was under indictment. And the U.S. Attorney defended, the Carmen Ortiz, who ran that office, defended the conduct of her prosecutors and said it was totally fine, she had no problem with it, and furthermore, we offered him six months. Well, that's rather astonishing. You said that your, your prosecutors, if they were behaving ethically, took the position in court that the, the proper punishment for what this, this young man had done, according to democratically enacted laws, were 35 years in jail, but you offered him six months. That to me, is an indictment of the system, particularly when the U.S. attorney who runs that office comes out and says, I have no problem with anything that happened in this case. And she was not contradicted uh, by her superiors of the Department of Justice, so apparently they agreed. We don't know how often that kind of thing happens, and that troubles me a lot, a lot. Uh, it is widely understood that overcharging is a thing. Talk to any federal judge. I was a law clerk for you in D.C. I saw it. Everybody has seen it who's working the system long enough. We, I'm sure we like to hope it doesn't happen much, but the problem is we don't know. So we have a very coercive uh, plea bargaining process. I think that's one of the reasons why 97% of people plead in the federal system. Maybe 97% of them are guilty, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'll end on this note. Uh, I'll talk, I can talk about this more in the q and I've done quite a bit of civil forfeiture. <coughs> civil forfeiture is a pr uh, practice that enables the government to take your property by asserting that it was involved in a crime but never proving it. So a police officer brings a PCC dog to your car. You know what a PCC dog is, right? You call it a drug sniffing dog. It's actually a probable cause creating dog. Because they bring the car to the dog and the dog goes like this. That's called an alert. That constitutes probable cause to take what's in that car. So they'll take what's in the car, they, they'll assert that it was connected with a crime, but they don't actually file charges. Um, that's quite common. 87% of DOJ forfeitures are civil, not criminal. Uh, and so that too is a whole different talk. We can talk about it in the QA. Let me give you this fact. Uh, during my time at the Institute for Justice, we handled about a dozen federal civil forfeiture cases. We won every single one of them. We got our clients' money back every single time, 100% win rate. Now, maybe it just so happens that uh, we were magicians, or maybe every single bad forfeiture case came to our office somehow, or maybe, maybe it's the case that when people have an effective representation, uh, it turns out that the procedures that we have in our criminal justice system and our civil forfeiture system are insufficient, they're inadequate, and having a system that is essentially run from start to finish by prosecutors, from which the criminal jury has been eliminated, and over which judges exercise almost no oversight is not a good system. I would say so. Thank you.
I'd like to especially thank the Federalist Society. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Clark for his willingness to not call this a debate. I'm, uh, I think of a debate as a place where people talk at each other. And in this political climate, I think we need less and less debates uh, and more and more people willing to listen to each other with an open mind. So uh, I'm going to assume everybody else in the room uh, loves this country as much as I do and wishes the best for it. Uh, and it will all, we all have the same goal. Uh, let me tell you two things I uh, won't do before I uh, speak a little bit about, about what I will do. Um, I won't argue from anecdotal evidence. Um, so I won't do that today. I, I don't do that in general. Um, I, I tried that once. I wrote a Law Review article defending uh, the federal system from uh, kind of the, the things what, the, what, what you heard earlier today and uh, from reports by the Wall Street Journal and the Federalist Society and the Heritage Society. And they'll give you, you know, little, little vignettes, little cases and, and tell you how unfair they are. Uh, and then when you go and read the actual cases, they're really nothing like they were described. Uh, by the Wall Street Journal or by the Heritage uh, Foundation. So I'm not going to do that anymore. If you're interested in particular cases, go look at them. You'll find out that they were misdemeanors, that it was businessmen who were making scads of money, uh, that it was a third warning. You'll, you'll find a lot of things that aren't, uh, aren't up there on, on the website that you really have to dig deeper to do. And I'm not prepared to do that today. Uh, the other thing I won't discuss is civil in-rim forfeitures. Um, I was told the topic was federal criminal law, so I came prepared to discuss federal criminal law. Uh, civil forfeiture is really a, quite a different issue, so I'm just going to leave that alone. Um, here's what I, I'd like to do. I'd like to spend the next 12 to 15 minutes discussing four major areas of federal criminal law. Uh, the first area I want to discuss is what federal prosecutors actually charge. So what can you expect to see in federal court? Uh, second, I want to discuss how the federal system is different than the state system, and how those differences uh, make, it, make the federal system advantageous for prosecuting certain kinds of crimes, like sophisticated fraud cases, like uh, drug cases where the drugs pass national and international uh, borders. Um, third, I'd like to discuss how much of Criminal law in general is federal criminal law. It turns out between two and five percent, and that uh, that is true for, for prisoners also. Most of them are state prisoners. Uh, and finally, fourth, I'd like to to start, and we'll see when my time runs out. Uh, start discussing what I consider to be the most significant problems in federal criminal law, which I don't think will be what uh, what Clark thinks they are. Uh, the, the ones I heard him. Uh, uh, complaining about are, are I see as state problems and not federal criminal law problems. But let's go back to what federal prosecutors do. I put a pie chart on the document camera here. Let's see if you can read it. Can you all see that? Not very well. Uh, well, let me just tell you about it. It's, it's been the same for the last 10 years. Basically, what the federal government does is immigration cases, drug cases, firearms cases, and fraud cases. That's really about it. That gives you 80% of the federal criminal caseload. That hasn't changed uh, in the last decade. And every now and then you'll see 2% regulatory offenses or 3% sexual offenses. But for the most part, it's those four categories. Uh, and it's been that way for decades. A uh, couple of other things I'd like to, to point out about what's what federal prosecutors are charging. Uh, they're charging less every year. Uh, we're down to, I think, 80,000 80, federal criminal defendants this year from a high of about 100,000, uh, I believe, in 2011. And it's, it's just been going down and down. Uh, so uh, there may be 4,000 <coughs> federal criminal offenses. And there may be 300,000 regulations. I'm not, I'm not really sure, and most federal prosecutors aren't sure, because those aren't the things that, that are charged. The things that are charged are 21 U.S. Code 841, right, drug offenses, 8 U.S. Code uh, 1324, unlawful reentry, mail fraud, uh, and firearms offenses. So we have a lot of other statutes, uh, but they're not, they're not used. Some of them are just 
past in reaction to uh, kind of the problem of the moment. So for example, in Maryland, uh, a woman had her car stolen and she had a baby in the back seat of the car. It was this horrible situation where the guy got in the car and drove off and didn't realize the baby was still in the car seat. You know, so Congress is like, well, there ought to be a law. So we passed a law, the carjacking statute, which is 0% uh, of the federal criminal caseload. I mean, you do see one now and then. It's a perfectly acceptable law, uh, but probably wasn't needed. Uh, you know, the Smokey the, the Bandit law, again, that's, I really hesitate to respond to it. It's not what you just did in this class. It is a willful misappropriation for profit. So you, you own a camp, and you say this is the Smokey the Bandit camp, and you make a lot of money doing that. And it's a misdemeanor, and you'll get a fine. And there's never been a case. Uh, I, I've, I've never seen a case. criminal law. It's really not what federal criminal law is about. So federal criminal law is about those four uh, offenses. Uh, probably what, what Clark will want to complain about are regulatory offenses. Uh, those have been steadily decreasing. 7% uh, of the criminal caseload was regulatory offenses in 1980, down to 2% today. And when I say regulatory offenses, those are offenses that for the most part still include mens rea. Or where they don't, they're misdemeanors and they have a, a, a mens rea of negligence and the person that's being charged has been warned over and over. So for example, things like uh, uh, food, food, drug, and cosmetic acts or hazardous waste materials, you know, pe people dumping things into the water. You know, those are the, the few regulatory offenses that, that we do see. And I, in my opinion, those are important offenses for which the government should, the federal government, really uh, should be handling those. Uh, and you really have to go out of your way. If you're a corporate defendant, uh, in 2002, there were 252 corporate defendants, down to 132 since it's in 2016. So unfortunately, you really have to be uh, producing fake software on millions of cars uh, if you want to, to even try to capture the attention of a federal prosecutor. Or you have to uh, have a, a big fire on an oil rig and kill 14 people before you can capture the attention of, of uh, federal prosecutors. It, it's not easy. So with the regulatory offenses, uh, I consider, in, in my opinion, we should be doing much more and with corporate offenses, we should be increasing <coughs> our involvement uh, and not decreasing, as uh, Clark would have you uh, believe. Let me tell you a little bit, how, how close am I to my... Let me tell you a little bit about how the federal system is different than the state system and, and what that should mean in terms of what prosecutors should be pursuing. Uh, states, the, the federal system doesn't have any general police power. Right? Only the states do. So the federal prosecutors shouldn't be prosecuting anything unless there is a jurisdictional hook in the Constitution, which is for the most part the Commerce Clause. There are a very few things of what I call a direct federal interest. So for example, bribery of federal judges, uh, other obstruction kind of cases, um, counterfeit, treason, uh, terrorism. Um, immigration that's in the Constitution. You know, there, there are a few things that really the federal government has to do, but beyond that, it's really their, their choice. And uh, I think because of this, they can, they're, they're not saddled with all the cases that have to get tried. If you're a DA in Austin and somebody's been murdered, somebody's been raped, you have to take that case, even if it's a dog of a case and you don't know who did it and you don't have much evidence, you, know, you can't just ignore it. Uh, the federal government has the luxury of really just, aside from those cases I just mentioned that are direct federal interest, they can take what they want. And so they take what they're good at. And I think what they're good at is uh, the size immigration and drugs is uh, they're good at sophisticated, organized crime. Crime that uh, moves across state borders and moves across international borders. So if we're really interested in fighting the drug war, and I am somewhat uh, ambivalent as to whether we should be, but it, if we're going to fight the drug war, we're not going to do it without federal involvement. Right? Rhode Island is not going to defeat the Kali cartel. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so we, we need the federal government doing that. If we want to stop 
uh, automatic or semi-automatic or fully automatic uh, <coughs> rifles from crossing state lines. We need the federal government to do that. States are not going to be able to do it. Uh, the federal government has more tools. Now, not only are they, they higher prestige and it's higher pay, as you say, the federal defenders are better, the prosecutors are better. Everybody playing in the system is better. Uh, again, in part because they're better paid, in part because it's higher prestige, in part because they don't have to take so many cases, so their caseload is low. They also have a lot of tools that the state actors don't have. So, as a, thank you, as a federal prosecutor, uh, I can uh, ask anyone to come sit before a grand jury, whereas if I was a, an Austin DA, I could only ask local people. So I have nationwide service of process. I can, uh, I can serve search warrants nationwide. I really have great uh, tools at my disposal for getting at these international crime rings. And so that's what the federal government should do, and I think that's, that's what it does do. And that, that differentiates it from the states where you get all of the, the rape, murder, and, and property offenses, which again I think is as it should be. Uh, my third uh, area that I was going to talk to you about today is the uh, size of the federal criminal apparatus. I, I don't know that a lot of students realize this. Uh, if you look at all felonies brought in the United States, somewhere between 2 and 5 percent of them are brought at the federal level. So most criminal law and most of the huge problems, pretty much all in my opinion, of the problems that you've listed with criminal law are really state problems. They're not federal problems. The federal, problem is a, the federal government is this kind of a small slice uh, of a very big pie. Uh, and this has remained constant. I, I was able to go back and find figures as far as 1924. It's hard to get figures earlier than that. But it has always been true, as far as I can tell, that the federal government remains 5%. So it's not encroaching upon state authority, because state authority is remaining uh, at 95%. So I really don't think that's uh, the, the size is a concern. Uh, same, same with prisoners. I, I agree that sentences are too high, and we have way too many prisoners in this country. But it's not particularly a federal problem. You know, there are, I think, uh, about 200,000 federal inmates. There are 2.5 million state inmates. So again, if, if, if there's a problem, the problem is not certainly not unique to the, to the federal system. In the interest of time, let me just go on to uh, the problems I think perhaps are unique to the federal system. Uh, let, let me start with what I think is the worst problem, and it's not unique to the federal system. You know, I just I just thought I'd tell you when it was. The, the biggest problem in my mind is racial disparity uh, in sentencing and racial disparity of just it, people in the criminal justice system. So if you look at statistics, 37% uh, of uh, state and federal prisoners combined are, are black people, and black people make up 13% of the population. Well, something is wrong there, right? Especially when studies show us that uh, black Americans don't commit crimes at a higher rate than white Americans. Well, why do they constitute 37% of the prison population? Why do Hispanics constitute 36% of the prison population? That's combined, federal and state. And if you separate out the numbers, it's a little worse at the state level than it is at the federal level. Uh, that's something I'd like to see both uh, criminal justice systems address. Um, coercive pleas and, and disparate sentences, uh, we can talk more about that. I, I, I do think that's a problem, but again, I don't know that that's really a problem at the federal level. Uh, the, the reason there are so many guilty pleas at the federal level is because prosecutors do their job. They do not bring a case. You know, they don't have to bring the cases like the state actors do, and they don't bring a case unless they're, they're pretty darn sure. You know, the prosecutors I talk to, although the standard is you can bring a case if, if it's a, you can get a grand jury to agree to it. Uh, they won't bring a case unless they're convinced in their mind that they have met the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. So most of these defendants are guilty, and I think, I think maybe all of them are guilty. When you look at the innocent projects that are sprouting up all over the country, uh, all of the people who have been released uh, as, a, as a result of those innocent projects are all in state and local prisons. They're not in federal prisons. So I think that should tell you something about the quality of, of the work being done. So I'm not saying there's not a problem in ferreting out guilty from the innocent, but again, I don't think it's a federal problem. Uh, I think it's more of a state problem. 
uh, the, the, the last thing I'll talk about is uh, something that I called independent norm federalism. Uh, is, is there a problem when states want to do something and the federal government doesn't want to let them? And so the example here is the, the marijuana example that you raised. Um, I think that's much less of a problem than you might think it is at first blush. Uh, it is very difficult to bring a case and win a case in a jurisdiction where the voters think a particular behavior ought to be legal. So uh, because 17 states think marijuana use should be legal, the federal government has come out with a memo saying we're not going to prosecute marijuana users so long as they follow state regulations. And, and they have it. Now maybe that will change in the sessions, but it hasn't changed so far. Because you would have to, to uh, indict a case, and then you have to find a jury full of California citizens who voted in favor of legalizing marijuana, and you'd have to get them to find somebody guilty, which is not so easy to do. So I've seen the same thing um, with the issue of right to die. You know, a number of states have decided there's a right to die, uh, or have assisted suicide, other states haven't. The federal government thought about waiting in, but it got kicked back by the court pretty quickly. The court said, uh, you can't, you federal government can't use the Controlled Substance Act to stop states from doing this because states get to regulate uh, uh, medical licenses, and you don't. So the, the few times I think the federal government has tried, it's, it's been kicked back. So I, I think that, that states as, as laboratories is actually working pretty well. Uh, without uh, any, any major change, which you might think is necessary. So that's federal criminal law in a nutshell. And uh, I turn it over to questions. Or, yeah. no. yeah, so I want to underscore, I'm glad it was a discussion, not a debate. debate I think it's better than the participants and the observers. I think actually there's not much real disagreement, on, I, I, other than I would say this. If I were confident that the federal criminal justice system operated the way that Susan has described it, I'd, I'd be much more comfortable. The real question, I think, and I encourage all of you to ask this question if you care about this issue, is does the system work the way that it has been described? I'm skeptical, but um, I certainly believe that, that the people in the system want it to work that way, believe that it works that way, uh, and I'm, I personally am not so sure that, we, that, we, that they're right. I think they have certain perceptual biases that, that you know, we all have as human beings. Uh, so I think just, I would leave it at that. The system as described is a good one, and it's certainly better than the states. I, I do agree strongly with that. If I, had to, if I had to wave a magic wand and start reforming somewhere, it'd be the states, not the feds. So I agree with that. But, but really, we're here for your questions, so let's see what you think. I'm curious where you both find the role of the federal government to be in the oversight of the state criminal system. Uh, I can start. Uh, the federal government has kind of gone into that through uh, something called the Hobbs Act, where it's applied uh, basically federal bribery statutes to states using something called the Hobbs Act. So it does police at least where, where states become very corrupt. You can use federal law to police that. But uh, otherwise, I don't think the system is particularly designed to have the feds uh, policing the states. Did you have a particular example in mind? No. I mean, I guess I mean, if we're talking about states needing reform, in the criminal justice system needing reform, who does it? Right. Maybe the federal government. I think the states have to do it with their own legislatures, and that's my opinion. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, I think, you know, the, the federal government has a modest role to play in this area. I mean, just take for one example, you talk to anybody who knows anything about the Chicago Police Department, and everybody agrees they routinely violate people's civil rights. And they're not alone, but they're notorious for it. Uh, the reason I use that as an example is because, of course, the Obama administration um, was fairly aggressive. The Obama Justice Department was fairly aggressive uh, in, in essentially working with or forcing local police departments to work with them and, and provide essentially oversight, better officer training, um, you know, more accountability, and so forth and so on. I do think there's a legitimate federal role there. Those are federal constitutional rights that police officers are violating, for example, in Chicago when they, you know, brutalize people, which I'm not saying they always do, but they do too much. Uh, so there's a role here, but I also would tend to agree that um, it's not the best approach because there is often a, a great deal of pushback from local law enforcement if it's not done properly, uh, and it may even be counterproductive. 
what I would say is there's no silver bullet, and reform has to happen uh, along a, different, a lot of different axes and, and through, with a lot of different inputs, and, and there's no magic solution, unfortunately. But thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, once you've kind of acknowledged, if you can acknowledge that 97%, I think, was the <coughs> statistic that you gave, um, of cases end up in a plea, and if there's an establishment of fact that a plea it does not necessarily actually mean guilt, um, is there a role that both of you feel the federal government could play in reforming that piece? Well, I don't think it's... It's not really 90, 97% of criminal convictions in the federal system are by plea. So it's really only 89% that are, of all uh, charges are resolved by plea. But yes, they're, 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 there's only 3% trials. And I don't particularly find that to be a, a problem in the federal system because I believe all of those people are, are guilty. I'd like to see that there's a lot we could play with in terms of, and that I suggested in other articles, giving better discovery and making sure people are getting the same sentence. But I'm not as concerned with separating out innocent from guilt in the federal system. On the other hand, I have great concerns in, in, of separating innocent from guilty people in the state system. And that's why we've seen all of these innocence projects crop up and we see that, that we are, in fact, uh, convicting innocent people. And at, at the state system, there are a significant number of innocent people who plead guilty. This is particularly true in the misdemeanor area. Uh, where you'll have someone go in and they're arrested and someone will sit down with them and say, well, you can plead guilty to this misdemeanor and leave right now, or you can fight it and we'll see you in three weeks or we'll see you in a month or maybe you'll get a trial in two months. And pe people will just, it, it is rational, I think, to agree to sign, sign on to a, a guilty plea then. So I have a, a lot of concerns and, and a lot of it surrounds uh, to bad defense counsel who are giving bad advice for people to take these pleas and bad flow of information. You know, Brady, there's a, a rule called Brady that requires prosecutors to hand over exculpatory evidence, but the person who decides whether Brady's being followed is the prosecutor, which is, it seems to me, exactly the wrong person. I don't know if you agree with that. Who should be deciding. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot at the, at the state level. A huge amount that needs to be done, in my opinion. So I think for me there are two problems with the 97% um, rate of convictions obtained through plea bargains. Um, the first is that in the abstract it wouldn't be as concerning, but it takes place in a situation in which we know that there are extremely coercive dynamics. And believe me, we've only touched on some of them. Um, if you're a criminal defense attorney, just to take one example, it's a felony for you to offer a witness a thing of value in connection with their testimony in a given trial. Do you know who gets to offer uh, uh, witnesses thing, a thing of value all the time and they do it all the time? Prosecutors. Uh, and what do they offer, usually? Reduced sentences. That's even more valuable than money. There's a reason why there's a law in the books against offering a witness a thing of value, because it, it causes us to be concerned that they might manufacture testimony. Why on earth do we let prosecutors do that, and what does it tell us about the reliability of the system? I have deep concerns. Uh, and of course, when you're, when you're in that plea bargain uh, situation, when you're in that negotiation, you know about all this. You know how much the deck is stacked against you. You know that they can uh, uh, stack charges. If they go to trial, they can bring in witnesses who've been induced to testify against you through all kinds of means. So that's one concern I have. I do, we just don't know what percentage of, of those people are actually guilty and how many <coughs> pleading guilty to things they didn't do. I hope it's low. It may be low. The other thing, it's for, in some ways it's even bigger concern for me, is we've taken a system that was literally designed around citizen participation. This is the U.S. Constitution and it was designed around citizen participation in the criminal justice system and we have effectively eliminated citizen participation in the criminal justice system. I can't help but think that's got to be a huge mistake. And maybe in ways we don't know. Maybe, maybe there's, we talked, to, so we were hearing about, for example, how you'd have to, if you wanted to bring a federal marijuana charge in California, you'd have to impanel a jury that would convict. No, you don't. You just have to be able to, to put the pressure on uh, enough to make that person be worried that they don't want to go to trial, that they're better off taking a plea bargain. Um, it's very free, infrequently the case that you have to be able to get a jury to convict in any given crime, because most of the time it's not going to come to that. Um, I think prosecutors could get a lot of useful information, a lot of useful feedback from juries if they took more cases to trial. And I think our system was designed with that in mind, and we've essentially eliminated citizen participation in the system. I think that's a huge mistake. I can't tell you all the ways in which it has negative consequences, but I'll bet it has a lot. Let's do one more question. So I understand Professor Klein's point of status quo is all right in the federal criminal system. 
I wonder, what is your solution? She's saying there's no change that's really necessary. What is your change to make things better? In the federal system, yeah. My, um, again, there's no magic bullet. I appreciate the question. Um, one of the first things I would do is have meaningful judicial review. Um, to take one example, marijuana remains a Schedule One drug, the most highly restricted. One of the requirements for Schedule One status is that the drug have no currently accepted medical use. The government keeps going into court and keeps saying that that's the case, and it's false. It's absolutely false. And they get away with it because the courts have essentially checked out. Um, that's one example. I litigate rational basis cases. I've been doing it for 17 years. I have seen a checked out judiciary. They're checked out when it comes to requiring, essentially, that, that the government have a good reason for putting somebody in a cage. They almost never have to give a good reason. They have to follow procedures, but they don't have to have a fundamentally good reason for doing it. So that's one thing I would change. Um, I would also ensure that, uh, particularly the state system, people have effective criminal defense, um, more like in the public defender system, and we're working on that, so that they can credibly go head to head. If they feel like they're innocent, they can credibly go to a jury trial um, and, and, and not have a public defender who's like, I don't have time for this. Um, I think we also have to look at sentencing. I think, I think federal courts and state courts, but also federal courts routinely hand down sentences that are morally indefensible. Um, now, there may be a legal duty for the judge to do it, but it's still morally indefensible. It's being done in our name. So those are just a few of the things I would change um, about the system. It's not a hurt. There's no silver bullet, as I said before. Um, I do want to add one last thing. I just remembered this. Um, so here's my Twitter handle. Uh, Cato has a, is going to have a really interesting event that you can live stream if you want to on November 7th. It's called Prosecutorial Fallibility and Accountability. And it's going to be a book event where three people who've, who've been through the complete um, federal criminal justice system from start to finish have written books about their experiences. Very eye-opening. And, and I encourage you, if you want to sign up and live stream it, you'll, you'll get a lot of information. It'll be, I'll tell you right off the bat, um, they all have bad experiences. So it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be a very particular perspective. But you, you might get some useful information. And one of the authors, who's coming to that panel wrote one of the best books that I've read. It was so good that I was taking care of my two toddlers by myself and my wife was traveling. I finished that book in a weekend while taking care of travelers. Howard Root, Cardiac Arrest. And that is, uh, oh, yeah, and he went through a full blown white collar criminal defense prosecution. He spent $25 million defending himself and got an acquittal right here in San Antonio. Um, an amazing guy opening book. Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and wrap up. Let's thank our speakers. If you have